Next week is Easter. Make sure to invite somebody that God is knocking on the door of their hearts. And they're just waiting for somebody to invite them to worship with them. And uh, take them out to lunch afterward, too. You know, it's a good way to do that. Welcome to the Oasis. Glad you're here. We start a new series next week, too, Mythbusters. If somebody's curious about the teaching segment of next week's worship. Um, another thing coming up, got a lot of stuff happening. We have the picture directories. Make sure to get registered for that. And I uh, want you to know this is a non-pressure situation. Yeah, they make their money probably by getting picture packages. But they, uh, this is a new organization that uh, teamed up and bought out Olin Mills, and they promise it's a no-pressure situation. But we want to provide everybody with a free 8x10. And, and they said, invite your neighbors. If somebody doesn't go to church, invite them. Uh, we want you to do that. And uh, we won't put them in the picture directory to think that they go here, but it's a great opportunity to invite somebody you know just to say, hey, get a family portrait and uh, maybe get to talk to them a little bit more, enjoy that fellowship. Dave Ramsey's coming up. Uh, we got so much stuff happening just uh, coming up uh, for the summer too, and that is uh, Dave Ramsey starting. There's a new reduced price. Just last week we confirmed that they extended the, uh, a new sale where we can get Dave Ramsey's stuff uh, cheaper, so check that out. Get registered for that. That starts in May. So a lot of stuff happening, so, so check that out. But we're in, our, we're in the final sermon in this series, The View. We've been talking about what we believe as a church. Now, there was, there was somebody that hadn't been able to be at the series, and they contacted me and they said, Greg, uh, sorry that I've not been able to, to hear any of your make-believe sermons. And uh, this hasn't been a sermon series about being make-believe. It's what we believe. <laughs> and I hope that we've been learning a little bit about... That was about dead joke, wasn't it? You know, sometimes you just got to talk about that. I know we're here this morning, and I know we love Jesus. But is everybody on spring break? <laughs> and, uh, but it, I hope that, and trust that we have been teaching and learning some stuff uh, from the Bible, some factual stuff that it's not just make-believe. But what you believe, what we believe, affects what we do in life. And the same is true spiritually. What we think about the Bible, moral values, heaven and hell is going to affect everything that we do. That's why in the Bible it says that the first step in coming to God is a right belief system. And that's why we've been talking about what we believe. And today we're going to talk about our spiritual heritage. Where we came from, why we do the things that we do a little bit. And how those doctrines and stuff were formed over the years. I had a professor in seminary, his wife, uh, was excited about going back and looking at their family tree. And uh, she went way back, and it was kind of cool. And I thought, well, I want to do that. I mean, she even made a book up. So I went back on my dad's side of the family. We had a gathering, and I started asking about our family tree. It didn't go back very far before there was divorce and alcoholism. And I thought, eh, that's not too good. And, I mean, this lady had found out that she was descendant from royalty. So I thought, well, I'll check my mom's side. I checked my mom's side, and it was like, not a whole lot better <laughs> either. And I felt like the guy that he spent $100 to have his, his family tree looked up and he paid $1,000 to have it hushed up, you know, because that's where I come from. But we have a lot of uh, past history. We're going to look at like 2,000 years uh, of history and look at our spiritual history and it's just going to be a very thin overview of that. But hopefully we'll get kind of a picture of why we do the things that we do today. In, in part. So I want to begin by looking at the church established. The church established. The church was established by Jesus Christ in 30 AD. And he said, I mean, Jesus promised that he was going to start a church and it was going to endure forever t until the end of time. And in Matthew's gospel, if you just want to follow along, Jesus said this, uh, starting with verse 15, or verse 16 actually. Uh, May 15, uh, Jesus said, Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon. And then down in verse 18, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I'm going to build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the church was built on Jesus Christ, but now the Catholics over the years have said, No, it's built on Peter. And Peter was kind of the first pope with... Uh, with uh, papal succession. But when Jesus said, I want to build my church, he was referring to himself. When he said, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. First Corinthians reads, no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Colossians says, he is the head of the body, the church. 
He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have supremacy. If anybody understood what Jesus said when he was talking about establishing his church, it would have been Peter. And Peter writes this in 1 Peter. For Scripture says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So Simon Peter said, Jesus is a cornerstone. He's the foundation of our faith. He's going to start the church, and we put our trust in Christ. And the church started about in 30 A.D. And the church began in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost with about 3,000 people. On this particular day, this Feast of Pentecost, all these people were assembled in Jerusalem and Peter stood up and preached the very first gospel sermon. And in, where are you going to go to find the history of the church? To see where it started? The book of Acts. In the book of Acts, verse uh, 14, chapter 2, it says, Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and he addressed the crowd. And here, Peter's going to preach the very first gospel sermon, the good news. He's going to open the door because he's got the keys to the kingdom. And the people heard and they listened and they responded to that gospel, that good news about Jesus coming to save mankind. And in Acts 2 verse 41, it says, Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The first church began on the first day as this huge church 3,000 people. It was a mega church. And this was the beginning of the church when Jesus told Peter, on this rock I'm going to build my church. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And it was opened. The door was opened. And the church started. And the purpose of that first church was to evangelize the lost and to edify the saved. And 2,000 years later at the Oasis, that's why we have as our kind of motto, our slogan, connecting people to Jesus and each other. Because that is our mission. That's our purpose for being in existence. But it doesn't take long before an organization to get sidetracked. And it is no different with the church. And this is the church corrupted. The church began to drift away from its foundation, from its original teaching, from its mission. And that's just the way that it is. When you forget what you're doing, you're going to drift down any path. And the church got corrupted. Now, we're really looking at a period that started about 300 A.D. to 1500 A.D. The Dark Ages, as we refer to them, we usually talk about the 5th century to the 15th century. So it's right starting in that time frame. But the church got corrupted for a very good reason. One was that the accessibility to a Bible was, you just, it was scarce. You couldn't walk down to the corner store and pick up a Bible for five bucks. You know, you just, you couldn't do that in that day. There weren't, there weren't very many Bibles. And uh, there wasn't the movable type printing press yet. They copied Bibles by hand. They were very expensive, very few. The ones that they had were probably chained. They were locked in monasteries uh, across the world. They were very expensive. And, and uh, the illiteracy rate was high too. So there wasn't a lot of Bible reading going on. Not a lot of accessibility to the scriptures. It's kind of like that game Whisper. You ever play that, you know? You whisper something and you spread that person to person. You get at the end, it's very distorted. Like if I said to, to Rich, Hey, Rich, I've been at church eight out of the last ten Sundays. And he shares that and it gets back there to the audiovisual guys. And uh, I say, Hey, what was the message back there? So, well, if, you, if Louisville played UK again, they'd win by ten points. It gets that bad. I mean, because, and, and that's kind of how the Bible was transmitted. It wasn't, people weren't reading scriptures or reading it. It was just kind of verbal. And with that happening and with what was going on with the governance of the church, things just kind of fell apart a little bit and became corrupt and things got distorted. But you just couldn't go out and get a Bible. I think another reason for the corruption was due to uh, the Bible teaching itself was augmented by more rules and traditions. Uh, just think of a couple of examples, uh, and this, these are a few things that happened, a lot of things happened, but, but one I think is interesting is the doctrine of the papacy, uh, or the succession of the popes. There's a debate between Catholics and Protestants about when this began, it's traced back to about 600 AD, but the Catholics would say, no, it began with Peter when Jesus made that statement on this rock, I want to build my church. But the issue is much deeper than just when was the first pope? It had to do with church hierarchy. Martin Luther and others wrote against this, uh, starting the Reformation in about 1500 or so, when he talked about the priesthood of all believers. 
because there's a genuine priesthood of all believers and there shouldn't be this huge separation. You know, in the Old Testament, there's God and sinful man and God established the priests, the priesthood to be a mediator between God and man. So people go to the priest, they present their offering, offerings and prayers to have that connection with God. When Jesus came, he reset everything. Things changed. He became the sacrifice for sin once for all. He became the mediator between God and man. So you don't have to go to a man anymore and pray or to interpret scriptures for you. You don't have to go to a man to be absolved from sin. There's no mediator like that. You don't pray to a saint. You go to Jesus Christ. You go to God directly. First Timothy reads this. There's one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all men. Whole new concept in the New Testament. The priesthood of all believers. 1 Peter 2.9, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. So there shouldn't be this, this huge clergy laity distinction. In fact, you don't hear it a whole lot as much anymore, having this clergy and laity. Jesus is the high priest. We all have accessibility. The foot of the cross is level. It's for everyone. But that teaching kind of got augmented and emphasized during the Dark Ages primarily. Then at about 1015, um, one other doctrine that you can see that's kind of like, man, how did they come up with that, is the celibacy of the priests, which came in vogue right after about 1000 AD. Uh, when, when marriage, the terms of marriage, particularly when it came to the clergy, became their new rules. And uh, you, you couldn't marry if you're going to be a priest. And, uh, but 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, reads this, that the Spirit clearly says in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits. And the things taught by demons, such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods. And the teaching on marriage um, kind of got distorted or augmented to become something I think the Bible never intended it for to, to be. And there's all kinds of doctrine. Doctrine of purgatory, selling of indulgences, um, different doctrines. Even baptism got distorted. But Jesus, I don't think, intended that when he established the church. Jesus prayed this in John 17, 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And the church in the dark ages through that period was united in its governance, but it really fell apart when it came to teaching and, the, and how it fragmented. Along about 1500, it rose along, and there are some guys who want to reform the church. They start reading the Bible again. They start thinking things should be different. This is the church reform. This is uh, protest. People started protesting what was going on in the church. And this is where we get the Protestant Reformation. And uh, let's, I just want to look, cover some of the key figures that occurred that you may uh, recognize some of these names. One of the protesters were, was, was Martin Luther. And uh, Martin Luther came about about 1530 in Germany. He was studying for the priesthood, very brilliant man. And he started reading the scriptures and said, you know what? There's a lot of corruption going on in the church. And he came out of that Roman Catholic church. And he, and he said, you know, things should be a little bit different. He started protesting what was going on. And uh, he was excommunicated because of that. But Martin Luther, you've heard of the Lutheran Church. That was kind of the beginning of the, of the Lutheran Church. Now, in the first sermon in this series, I want to make this caveat again. I know I bring up the Catholic Church a lot. don't mean to bash on a, on a church or something like that. But since the Catholic Church dominated the history of the church, it's just logical that we bring those comparisons and contrast up. And uh, so that's what I'm just doing there. Shortly after Martin Luther was John Calvin, a lawyer in Switzerland. He began a similar movement in about 1536, and he joined with, with John Knox, came along about 1550 or so. And uh, he was a bold advocate for reform in Scotland. And uh, their teachings eventually formed the Presbyterian Church, what we know as that. And then i got to mention the Church of England, King Henry VIII, King Henry VIII was married to this lady named Catherine who bore him no children. And he wanted to have that marriage annulled. And he went to the Pope and he said, well, annul my marriage. And the Pope said, uh-uh. 
And King Henry VIII said, I want to start a new church. So he got the Archbishop of Canterbury. They kind of started a new pope system over in the east. He got his marriage annulled, but he really wanted to marry this lady by the name of Anne Boleyn, and he did. And uh, she didn't give him any children either. And instead of <laughs> having his marriage annulled, he had her executed. Now, I can't really remember right, but I think it was with the guillotine. And, but I, it was, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, you know, you know, crazy. But that was how, I mean, that was, and that was, we traced back, I think it's the Episcopalian, the Episcopal Church, really, to the Church of England. And some of those things kind of uh, get confusing for me. But the, the Episcopal Church was the first one to America. You know, the, the old North Church, the North Boston Church, uh, one, one of by land, two of by sea. Uh, that's where we get that. But we're, uh, the Baptists come along. About 1611 AD, we really don't know who to attribute the Baptist church to. Some say John Smith, uh, some say Roger Williams, and you know, some say John the Baptist. Baptist church goes all the way back to John the Baptist, but you know, it really doesn't. Uh, the term Baptist came from Anabaptist, or to be baptized again. You know, people were being baptized as infants, and these people came along and said, you know what, immersion is by those who believe. And there was this big movement of adults getting rebaptized or Anabaptist, and the Baptist kind of that name stuck with that, you know, baptized again. But they, the, the Baptist church quickly became one of the largest non Catholic denominations in America during that uh, later period. Then there's John Wesley from England, along with his brother Charles, about 1739. Uh, the Wesleyan movement, a call to holiness among the followers. And then you have the Methodist link with uh, George Whitfield, who brought the Great Awakening to America. But all kinds of churches uh, stemming up, breaking away, protesting the way things had always been because they were seeing and reading the Bible and saying, you know what, we were, and they started landing on these different creeds and doctrines. But problems persisted. You had the, the reform and you had all these churches, but divisions continued. And although the movements helped, I think, to reform and bring the people back to Bible teaching, they still divided. Why? Well, because nobody can just figure out where to land and have harmony. Uh, I want to pick on the Baptists a little bit. I'm from the Louisville area, the Baptist seminary is there. I mean, you think about the Baptist. I mean, the Baptist, you got American Baptist, uh, Southern Baptist, Missionary Baptist, Foot Washing Baptist, Charismatic Baptist, you got all kinds of Baptist churches because they just can't really agree. They, they got these little things that they get kind of upset about. Well, there's a Ch Church of Christ writer by the name of, of Max Lucado. You may be familiar with him. He kind of does a spoof, you know, on the Baptist. So you got a Baptist walking down the street carrying a Bible. And another guy walks up and he says, Hey, you got a Bible? He said, You a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. He says, You born again? Yeah, I'm born again too. What church are you part of? Baptist? I'm a Baptist too. You got this camaraderie going on. Are you a Northern Baptist? You a Southern Baptist? I'm a Southern Baptist. I am too. Are you conservative or moderate? I'm conservative. I am too. You King James or New International? King James, I am too. You charismatic or non charismatic? Non charismatic, I am too. Do you use a wooden pulpit or a plexiglass pulpit? Guy says, Plexiglass. You heard it. Can't have nothing else to do with you. And people divided over things like a wooden pulpit and a plexiglass pulpit. And it's just about that bad with denominations. And there are all kinds of movements have come together and they split again because of bickering and infighting. But that's not what God intended. The Bible says Jesus knew their thoughts and said any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and a house divided against itself will fall. And Jesus prayed in Gethsemane that, that his disciples, that the church would be united. In John 17, he says that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. And the world looks on at all the churches and they go, which one? They don't go, wow, boy, how they're unified. They go, what brand's right for me? What teaching's right? Well, if they can't get it straight, none of it must be straight. Well, around 1800, this is when we get the, the, the church restored. 
This is where we get the restoration movement. We, uh, the Oasis Christian Church, are part of the restoration movement that began in, in the 1800s, kind of kicked off, and a, a bunch of people got together and said, we want to restore our teachings, our fellowship, back to the Scriptures. And you know, I get the question, we're the Oasis Christian Church, the Pueblo West is the Pueblo West Church of Christ, and I've had people come to me and say, why do you guys do stuff with them all the time when we're so different? Well, we're not different. There's a nuance or two, but we're not really different when it comes down to doctrine and teaching, maybe in practice and what we do, yeah. But we're right down the line in our beliefs. So let's look at some of the Restoration Movement key figures and, and where they came from, from their past. Thomas Campbell was born in Ireland, 1763. His father had been Catholic. He was converted to the Anglican Church. Thomas Campbell became a teacher, then a preacher. He was a preacher, and this was the name of the church. Get this. The Old Light Antiburger Seceder Presbyterian Church. Those names all reflecting the different divisions, and that's how they had to tag it. So you're going down the road, you see Oasis Christian Church, Pueblo West Church of Christ, then you see the Anaceter Anabaptist Church, because they wanted to know this is the right church because of all of the divisions. But Campbell began to look at all the divisions and said, why can't we just get back to the Bible? And he, he wanted to do that, he thought about that. That idea alone got him kicked out of his his old light Annaberger Seceder Presbyterian Church, kicked out. Well, his son, Alexander Campbell, was coming to America, got shipwrecked, started thinking about why are there so many divisions? And he was excited to find that he and his father had reached the same conclusion when they got back together in America, and they were excited about that. We're going to restore the Bible, just restore the church back to the Bible. And they started a church in Virginia, Brush Run, in about 1811. Contemporaneous with that was a, a guy named Barton W. Stone, Presbyterian minister in Kentucky, at Cane Ridge, Kentucky, <laughs> that he wanted to just get back to the Bible to get rid of all the creeds, let's join together on Jesus Christ. And there's this great revival meeting in 1801. And uh, the highlight of that revival that lasted uh, for quite a long time was everybody from all these denominations got together and had the Lord's Supper on, on one particular Sunday morning. And the mood was, let's just break away from all that stuff and get back to the clear teaching of Scripture. And so I want to look at, those are some of the key figures and, and key points on the Restoration Movement. And let's look at some of their slogans, I think, are very helpful, it's kind of neat, uh, some of their key goals. And uh, one was to eliminate the creeds and traditions. I mean, you've heard of the Apostles' Creed, and sometimes you, to join a church, you have to sign off on that creed. Well, they wanted to get away from creeds and traditions that divide. Another key goal was to restore doctrinal purity just by using the Scriptures. Let's just read them and see what they say. And the third was just, let's strive for unity. Let's get back to evangelism, edifying to save, just taking the gospel to the world. And they had some great slogans that came out of that too, and, and you know, they kind of became creeds too over time. <laughs> but some of their good slogans were, we're not the only Christians, but we're Christians only. You know, you can parse that. Where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible's silent, we are silent. That's That's good. No book but the Bible, no creed but Christ, no name but the divine name. And doctrine, unity, and opinion, liberty, and all things charity, or in all things love. So they said, you know, in the essentials, we're going to stand on those. And we talked about those and those essentials of the evangelical church that we stand on. But in matters of opinion, where we can have some flexibility, these secondary doctrines, we can still be brothers and sisters in Christ without having another denomination. So the purpose of the Restoration Movement was just not to develop another, another denomination. In fact, we are referred to as not, we're a non-denominational church because we're not affi affiliated with anybody. And we became one of the fastest growing churches at the time that the Restoration Movement really began to be a movement in America. But tragically, uh, we too started splitting and fragmenting over time. 
in the early 1900s. So, you know, we were about 100 years or so, and we started dividing like every other group. And uh, problems happened. So, you know, we were Christians only, and, uh, but then we had a, a split when we had the Church of Christ, the non-instrumental Church of Christ, splitting off from us or us from them. And it was a division over music. Hey, you know what? We can't have musical instruments in worship. And they stood on that. They say, uh, that's an argument from the silence of the scriptures. We don't believe that's right. So they got rid of all their instruments. And you came to worship and you, just, you sang without an instrument. Now, you step back and take that logic seriously. And how far are you going to take that? Okay, it's an argument from the silence of scriptures. We're not going to have any musical instruments. Well, we might as well get rid of the PA systems. That's not, that's not talked about in scripture. We might as well get rid of the electric. Might as well get rid of the air conditioning. Might as well get rid of the padded seats. Oh, yeah, we, we don't have padded seats. But how far are you going to take that? And, and we talk about that. Today, the Pueblo West Church of Christ, non-instrumental, they understand that from their history, it came, they were birthed out of, this is a silence of scripture argument today, they recognize and will state, we do this because of preference. We do this out of tradition. We don't think that it's sacrilegious to have a music. And that's what they prefer, and that's the nuance, and that's what makes us really different. But our doctrines are the same, and we have that prerogative because in essentials unity, but in those secondary things, flexibility. In opinion, flexibility. And that's why we can still be together and love them uh, easily. Another division occurred with the disciples of Christ. The disciples of Christ, um, their, co their universities, colleges, um, really liberal teaching. I mean, they've done away with even the, the, the integrity of the scriptures and uh, baptism. A whole lot of doctrines where, where we stand, where they say no, no more. And, and we split off on that. But... But what we sought to do in the Restoration Movement was to restore Bible teaching. So we're not a denomination. We don't have a headquarters somewhere that tells us what to believe. We're autonomous, each body. Uh, we're, we're autonomous. So in doctrine unity, in matters of opinion, liberty, and all things love. But people like rules, don't they? I mean, instead of just reading the Bible, people love the one-liners. I mean, we're in a sound bite culture. And we want to hear it. Hey, what's, just give it to me, preacher. What do you believe on that? I mean, I got an email a, a few weeks ago. And they said, and somebody that, that goes here, and they said, you know, what's the church's belief on baptism? And I said, we believe the Bible teaches it. Well, that's really not what they wanted to hear. And uh, so they weren't here last week when I talked about baptism. So I sent, uh, attached the sermon <laughs> and sent another email and said, hey, this is, this is, maybe this is what you want, some scriptures to kind of define it a little bit. But we, we want clear distinction. We want those definitions. But people ask all kinds of questions. And, uh, and you know, people can get upset at some of the answers. Uh, one common question used to be, is what's your view on women wearing pants to church? And, you know, now it's kind of more, what's your dress code? You know, there's still some churches that are concerned about women wearing pants, but it's more of what's your, what's your dress code. Well, the Bible, you know, it talks about dressing modestly and it, that God looks at the heart, not at the outward appearance. And, and here in our church, you, you can't go to any one person. They say, well, yeah, this is our rule on how to dress. I mean, you look around and you know we don't have a dress code in this church because we just try to follow what the Bible says, and it doesn't matter how you dress, God wants us to come here. And we don't want that to be a point where people feel like they're not able to belong to the church. So we, we just dress modestly, God looks at the heart. I've been asked, what's your church's opinion on dancing? I said, we don't have a rule on dancing. I said, I got my opinion. You probably have your opinion. I don't dance. But that doesn't mean that we're going to, I don't even line dance, but that doesn't mean we're going to make a non-dancing church. And then a quick one to follow up that said, do you drink, preacher? Well, if I drank, we'd be dancing. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, I think I'd only dance in public if I were drunk. 
so, you know, we don't do that. But I get that question. Preacher, what's your church believe about drinking? Well, we don't have a stance on drinking. You know, the Bible says, uh, don't be drunk. It, it, there's not, uh, it, and that's what we stand on. The Bible says don't be drunk, so that's what the Bible says. There's no prohibition in Scripture about drinking. That's where we leave it. It's my personal discipline not to drink. Um, there's not a verse in Scripture that says thou shalt not drink, but that's been my preference. I drank before I was a Christian, and I decided it's, easy, it's easier to say, no, I don't drink. So that's just what I do personally. And... Uh, um, and, and besides, when I drink, I kind of feel like the guy who said, when I drink, it makes me feel single and see double. And that's, you know, it's, I can relate to that. So when you come to be a part of the Oasis, we say, do you believe in Jesus? Do you accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Yeah. We don't say, well, then we want you to sign this clause that says you're not going to drink. We don't have any of that. Where the Bible speaks, we speak. Or the Bible doesn't speak. We, we try to be silent on that. And we stand on the scripture. Liberty and opinion uh, and, and in all things love. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'm going to draw all men unto myself. And the Christian church has been a church where people from a lot of different backgrounds have come together and found home and found a place where they could worship uh, and, and follow the scripture. And I want to illustrate that just a little bit. I know the, in this room there are people from a variety of different backgrounds, or Lutheran, Methodist, uh, atheist, agnostic, pagans. I mean, we got all kinds of backgrounds. Think about, you know, if you're Baptist, think about that. When I count to three, if you have a Baptist past, just say Baptist. Uh, on the count of three, if you're a Lutheran, say Lutheran. If you're on the count of three, Wesleyan, whatever you are, atheist. On the count of three, say it all at the same time, what your background is. One, two, three. Christian. Man, that was confusing. I don't even know what any of you guys were on that. Now, think, now, now let's do this. When I, on the count of three, since Jesus Christ is really who we're following and who unites us and whose scriptures that we follow, let's just say Jesus on the count of three. One, two, three. Jesus. Jesus. Boy, that was plain and simple. Say it again a little more softly. Jesus. Isn't that good? That's who unites us. That's why... We are who we are today. That's the history of our church, that we stand on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And that's what we ask of you, if you join the fellowship of believers here, that we would join together and that we would make a church. I want to close with an illustration. Uh, there's a Sunday school teacher teaching little kids, and uh, one little kid came in, first time guest, had one arm. And she thought, oh, I hope that none of the kids bring attention to that. Got through the whole lesson, and none of the kids brought out that imperfection on that young fella. And, uh, and then at the very end, the teacher was excited. She said, okay, kids, in closing, let's do that little exercise. Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors, and here are all the people. And she knew right then. She thought, oh, no. And she was saved embarrassment when the little girl reached over and grabbed the little boy's hand and said, Davey, let's build the church together. And that's what we're about. We're all so imperfect as individuals. But we're together using our strengths and imperfections to build God's church the way that He wanted it to be built. I want to read, I want to close and, and read this scripture together that kind of illustrates that. Just to be unified. If we could read Ephesians 4 together. Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into Him who is the head, that is Christ. From Him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And that's what we're about. That's what we believe. That's our view. And we believe that to be the view of Scripture. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word, your truth, that your Scripture is truth. 
that you've preserved this Bible, that you've, yea, preserved the church, that we might know the pathway to you, that Jesus Christ is the only way. I pray here at the Oasis that we would stand firm on those essentials that you teach in the Bible, that we could communicate those properly to everyone, to be able to reach out where the world can look at us and say, you know what, something special going on in that place, and it's because that Jesus Christ is lifted up here, that we stand on the foundation of Jesus, and that's what we hold to. And yeah, with the quirks, the imperfections, I know we're imperfect, and we don't always communicate probably the way that we should or act the way that we should. I pray, oh God, that we would exalt you today, and each person here today would understand how important it is just to see Jesus, that I stand with Jesus, that we can boast in nothing but the cross of Christ. I pray, oh God, if there's anyone here today who's heard your truth about what it means to be a Christian, about what it means to follow you, about what we stand on in faith and practice, what you, we believe to be true in the Scriptures, I pray today that you would nudge us closer to you, that we will have heard what you want us to hear. If anyone's here today, oh God, who'd like to join the fellowship of this church, I pray they would let us know. If there's someone who needs to be baptized, never having been baptized, I pray they would walk through and have that doorway open. I pray, oh Father, that you would help us to be a church on task, to know that it's just not for me to enjoy, that our mission is a personal mission, not just for the church, but for me to go out and invite, to tell others, this is a place where we can learn about you, that we would invite to Easter when we know you're knocking on the heart doors of many individuals, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers. Father, help us to have that encouragement to give the invite. It might be a changing invite for eternity. Give us the strength to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.